right. I asked my family to come up. They're going to talk about the slides. I think each one is going to do that. Um, and so uh, I will guess we will we will get started with that. I just wanted to point out one thing that I found was really neat as we were taking prayer requests. I don't know if you realize there were three Davids that we prayed for. Caitlin's dad, David, David, David Moody, and then our David. So I thought as God brings the, the name of David to mind this week, pray for those Davids. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to read a thank you note that our family has written to you guys. To our church family, we want to express our heartfelt appreciation to such a gracious and wonderful church family. We couldn't ask for a better church family. Your support and encouragement over the last five years has been amazing. You have stood by our side, encouraging and praying for us during the difficult times, and you have given praise to our Father and have had joy with us when we have received good news. This reminds us of Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And that's what you guys have done. Not only have you been God's hands and feet through encouragement and prayer, but you have also gone above and beyond financially. God has used each of you, our family and friends, to continually show us that this adoption is his will. We want to thank you for being a part of this journey. You are all such an important part. Through our church family functioning as the body of Christ, God has been glorified. Whatever your role has been, know that we are so grateful. So we just wanted to tell you guys a huge thank you. Many of you, we don't know who gave because it was anonymous. And I wish we did so we could personally write you a note, but we don't. So we want to thank you from here and, and know that God will bless you. So um, our first slide, our journey began on November 30th. And um, for those of you who maybe are visiting here, um, our family's in the process of adopting a little boy from Haiti. And we've been in this process five years. And we finally got to go meet him for the first time. Um, so I don't know if you all know this, but Richard and I are not world-renowned travelers. So flying brings a lot of anxiety in and of itself. And um, my sister had to walk me through, Tanise, this is what you do. This is where you go. So I have 24 hours before we left, I went online and I checked us in. We saw that we had flights from Omaha to Atlanta. We had our, our seating, our seats were assigned to us, but our flight from Atlanta to Port-au-Prince did not have seats assigned to us. So we had to go to the gate to get our seats. Um, so we get to Omaha and Isaac and Morgan were really excited because this was their first trip flying. And the plane takes off, it's five in the morning, the lights are all low, people have on their headphones, pillows, they're trying to sleep and Isaac squeals, this squeal of joy when the plane takes off. And it was, it was fun, it was joyous to hear that. Um, then we get to Atlanta, and we land in Atlanta, we find our gate, everything seems like, oh, this is going really smooth. Richard proceeds to go up to the clerk at the counter and ask for our boarding passes. And she said, in her, she must not have been having a very good day because she was not the friendliest woman. And she said, Sir, we have older, oversold by 10 seats. You will probably not be leaving on your flight today. And we, Richard tried to tell her how important this flight was. We were meeting our son. We had to be in country for 15 days. She really didn't care. So he came back, told me. We started praying and in our minds. And uh, I went up and just tried to explain to her. She didn't really even acknowledge that I was there. And then pretty soon... Some papers started printing off, and she just hands them to me. She doesn't say anything to us. And I look at him, and I'm like, Richard, these are our boarding passes. So we go back, and we sit down. And we're like, thank you, Lord, we got on this plane. Um, and then McKenna was watching a screen, and she saw that not only did we get our boarding passes, but we were upgraded. So we didn't get first class, but we were right behind first class. So it was just like a little extra love from God. So we got on our, got on our flight. Um, the next slide shows a picture. We landed in Haiti. And this is a picture of um, our guest house. I didn't actually ever take a picture of the part where we stayed at. But what I wanted to tell you about the walls around all of the people's homes in Haiti. Um, Theft is a huge thing, and so everyone has cement walls or brick walls, and there's either razor wire all around the top, or these had like sharp, I don't know, iron pieces sticking up. And the other thing, many of you gun lovers in here would love this, but in Haiti, you just walk around with a gun, like shotgun, our security guards, everybody had, not everybody, 
lots of, all security guards had guns. And so you just saw guns all the time. So in our American minds, we had to say, this is good, this is okay, that we see guns everywhere. Um, but we did feel safe everywhere. Um, so we came to the guest house before we got to go meet David, and um, we were very excited to get to go meet him. Um, just real quick on this slide, I wanted to tell you that that little area right there, that was really our only yard. So we played soccer, we played frisbee. This is where we did a lot of bonding. Um, it wasn't very big, but it's what we had. Um, the next slide then shows the orphanage. So we dropped our, all our bags off at the, at the guest house and then the orphanage was maybe about six blocks away. Um, at first they would give us rides, but then as we began to feel more comfortable, um, we would walk back and forth. Um, so that's the orphanage. On the front there uh, is a porch, and it was a covered porch. We spent a lot of time out there because it was shaded. And in Haiti, it's very hot all the time. It doesn't feel like December. Um, you sweat. So like as you guys are all preparing for Christmas, we're thinking, oh, I wish it was <laughs> Christmas here. <laughs> um, then the next slide is... Um, a picture of us meeting David for the first time and um, as we talk I don't know if we'll all call him David because in Haiti his name is not David that's what we're gonna name him when we come here but in Haiti his name is Cephas Josue Victor Victor is his last name Cephas is his first name but they call him by his middle name which means Joshua and the name is Josue and I don't know if any of you, for any of you, that is a hard name to pronounce. It took us about three days because they would say it five different ways. It'd be Josie, Jose, Josue, Josie. I mean, there were just multiple ways to say it, and we were like, what, what's his name? <laughs> um, so when we arrived at the orphanage, we asked for Cephas, and he was not aware that, I don't think any of them were aware that we were coming that day, um, but a couple of the orphans spoke English, and so they went and found a nanny, and then she proceeded to bring him to us, and the emotion kind of caught us all off guard. Um, we all were filled with tears, and I don't know that we quite expected that. Um, in Haiti, you don't show emo you don't cry. So I'm sure they probably all thought we were these weenie Americans <laughs> bawling when we met our son. But he greeted us with a huge hug. He, um, I introduced myself to him first, and he just held on. And then as um, I was down on my knees, he just stood beside me with his arm around me and just kind of pulled me in as we introduced him to the rest of the family. Um, it was a really tender time for us. So um, the next slide is he, McKenna, he loved all of our hair, but McKenna, this blonde, kind of sticks out in Haiti, and he would just touch her hair, and, um, and they love to touch our arms, because they don't have hair on their arms, like we do, and so they would just feel our arms. And actually, Isaac was a movie star in Haiti. Um, it was his two, week, two weeks of fame. We don't know why, we don't quite understand, but everyone, adults, children, everyone wanted to touch him and have their picture taken with him. It was the strangest thing, and one lady said, oh, he's a little angel. I thought, no, he's not. So I don't know if, if I don't, for, we don't know why. We don't know if we were the only crazy Americans, you know, that ever take their young child to Haiti, or why, but even the adults on the streets would just gawk at Isaac, and he did not like that very much. He, he didn't like all the attention. So he and Carissa actually spent a lot of time at the guest house, which I'm sure Carissa will tell you about. Um, then the next slide is just us loving with David. He loved sitting on our laps. He loved holding our hands. Um, I, I know all of you have probably either been a mom or a grandma or, or held a newborn baby, but you, you just or a father, but you, you just look at that baby and you look at all their features. And I, count my, I caught myself the first couple of days just staring at him and him catching me staring at him, probably thinking, what's this psycho woman doing staring at me? But I would just admire his eyes and his nose and his ears. And you know, our, my other biological children have grown in my stomach. And, and as they grew in my stomach, you know, I fell in love with them. They'd kick, they'd move, and I just fell in love with them. But David has grown in my heart over these five years. And it was like I, I birthed him out of my heart when I saw him in Haiti for that first time. And it was just amazing. And, and then this leads to the next slide, which probably for me was one of the most God 
neat moments in Haiti. Um, it's not a real great picture of him, but this is when it happened, was he was out playing in the yard with Morgan, and they were just playing catch, and he was laughing and talking Haitian Creole. You know, he doesn't speak any English. Um, and so we, we were just playing, and I was just sitting on the step watching him, and this overwhelming sense of love just flowed out of my heart. This joy that I was feeling watching my son play, and I thought of how God, when he says that we're his adopted sons and daughters, that love and that joy that he feels from us, I just, I really connected with that, that day, with God, just thinking about how much he loves me, even though I'm, I'm his adopt, when I'm his adopted son or daughter, because I felt that love for David that day. So I'm going to talk about, can you? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the orphanage where Josue lives. Um, this first slide is where they, where those people are. That's where some tables are. Um, that's where they eat their dinner, and then they mostly just play back here. And then this next slide shows where, um, well, this is their kitchen. And since they don't have electricity, then they have to use fire and coal. And so it gets really hot because it's like a awning. And so it gets really hot while they're cooking the food. And um, then this next slide is um, sh showing them washing their clothes. And we had to do the same where you um, just dump in some water into a tub with some hot water, and then you wash your clothes that way. And once we got home, I am very thankful for our washing machine. <laughs> and um, then this next slide is what they eat. And it's kind of like cornbread with um, watered down refried beans over the top and to me it does not look very appetizing but um, then this next slide um, is where they sleep and so they just pull a mattress over those beds and they don't get a pillow or a blanket or a sheet and um, I've noticed that when he would go to bed he'd go to bed sleeping on his pillow but then um, in the middle of the night or whatever he'd slide off of it because he's not used to having a pillow. Um, and this next slide has nothing to do with the orphanage, but it was us, we got to experience eating sugar cane. So you just walk down the street and you'd see a guy with a wheelbarrow. It, they looked like long sticks. Um, but he'd take a knife and he'd just like shed it, it or peel it. And, um, and then you just b um, bit off a piece and then you just chewed it and then you basically just got the flavor and then you spit it out. And um, it reminded me and Isaac of like how you chew if you were to chew a corn stalk. Um, but, and then that's it for me. So thank you for praying for us. Okay, can I tell? You like playing with David? Do you see the picture? Do you see the picture this back there? See the picture? Oh, it's okay. right there. Tell him what you did. When we were at home, Isaac wanted to yeah. be a part of the, the slideshow, but maybe we're a little bashful. So we had him pick out his favorite things. He loved playing with Josue on the little, it was a ship for them, right? <laughs> Okay, the next pirates. slide. Oh, yeah, they were pirates. Oh, and they, what'd you, what'd you do there? Oh. <laughs> they love playing on the playground. We went to a playground, and Josue had never um, played on equipment. We had to kind of teach him how to climb up a, a rope net thing. Um, he didn't, he'd never really, done, he'd never done teeter totters, so they really enjoyed this. Next slide, Kirby. Oh, can you tell him about this? What was your favorite part? This was, this was Isaac. I oh, stop. This was Isaac's favorite part. He loved jumping the waves with Josue. So they would, they played in the ocean. That was that was Josue's first time to the ocean. That was Isaac's first time to the ocean, and and Morgan's too. But it was a special moment for our family. Isaac and I spent a lot of time in our room that we stayed in. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but I am a huge fan of snow. Um, you can ask any of my family members. I freak out whenever it snows with excitement. And um, if you did not know, in Haiti, it 
never snows. <laughs> so it being the Christmas season especially, I was in some very need of some snow. So one morning Isaac and I, when Isaac and I were at the guest house alone, we I searched our room for anything I could find to make our room feel a little bit more like Christmas and like it was actually December. Um, so I found a notebook and a mom had these little pair of travel scissors. They like, you could barely fit your fingertips in them, but they did the job. So the whole morning I spent cutting out snowflakes and Isaac and I hung them up and surprised everyone else when they came back, but um, that was fun. And then the next slide, our room wasn't known for space. It was um, very small in order to make room for um, Isaac and just wait to play. We had to slide two of the bunk beds together. Um, the two beds together created a space for dad and the boys to wrestle um, and just kind of play trucks and farm and stuff. And then the next slide. Um, Morgan, before we left, um, with mom's help, had made a photo book for David. Um, in the photo book were pictures of just us six, um, and then pictures of the farm and the house and um, the animals around the farm. And every night before he went to bed, we would, um, one of us, usually Morgan did it with him, but one of us would flip through the pages with him and he would point to each person in the pictures and say our names. Um, I think that was one of the best things that I ever heard while I was there was him saying my name and that was my favorite part of every evening was listening to him point to each picture and kind of giggle each time he did it and say each of our names. It was very special. Um, and then the next slide. While we were there, we had the incredible opportunity to meet this couple and their family. Um, originally from Canada, Gary and Mavis started adopting Michaela. She's the girl there with them. Um, Michaela was a slave girl who was rescued and put up for adoption, but since she was a slave girl, she does not have a birth certificate, um, which makes it very difficult um, when you're trying to adopt. So shortly after starting the process, they found out that they could not bring Michaela back to Canada with them. So after much prayer, the two of them packed their bags and moved to Haiti so that they could live with her. Um, they've been there for two years now, and they are Michaela's legal guardians. Um, while they've been there, they've started an organization called Beauty from Ashes, and they now um, house 13 girls who were slave girls. Um, they, these girls were not used for as slaves for sexual reasons or anything. It was strictly for hard work. Um, either the parents couldn't afford to keep them, and they would give them to an uncle or um, a cousin or a friend who would then work them practically to death with no food and very poor care. Um, so IBSER goes in and takes the girls out of situations like this and then brings them to Gary and Mavis. Um, Gary and Mavis have provided a, a setting where these girls can feel what a family feels like um, and they've shown them the love of Jesus and um, Gary said it takes a long time for um, them to build their trust after everything that they've been through, but after watching them, you can tell that each of the girls trust Gary and Mavis with all of their heart. When they're out in public, they don't linger far from their side, and then when we went to their house, it was amazing to see the love that they had um, between the 13 girls that are there and Gary and Mavis. They were, they were a family. Um, while we were in Haiti, we had the privilege of getting to meet David's mom. That is her in the picture there beside me. Her name is Luckney. And when we went to Haiti, we didn't know for sure if we would get to meet her because that they kind of shy away from that because you could have bribed her or um, somehow to get your son. Um, and so they don't encourage that. But she happened to show up at the orphanage and knocked on the door and asked if we wanted to meet her. And of course we did. Um, so then we were able to meet with her there just for like 10 minutes but then we set up a time uh, the day before we left and we were with her for three hours in the afternoon and she brought a translator so we were able to learn a lot about her and her life um, and um, Richard's and my goal from the beginning when God laid adoption on our heart it was never to take a child from 
someone that wanted to raise their child. Um, because it, we feel like if, if this was a perfect world and there was no sin in this world, every child would have a mother and a father. That's God's design. But um, because we live in an imperfect world, it doesn't happen that way. And so our goal was to provide that for a child. Um, and so as we talked with Luckney, she was very young when she got pregnant. Um, she was actually raped, and um, she was 15 when he was born, and her parents and her um, decided that it would be best to put him up for adoption. And so when we visited with her, we wanted to make sure that this was still her desire, and um, it was. And Richard was actually able to thank her for not having an abortion. And um, like I said, Haitian people don't cry, but she got teary-eyed at that time and said, this makes me very emotional. Um, and we thanked her for not having abortion, and at the same time, we're thanking her. She's thanking us for providing a home for her family, or for her son, and um, we really hope, you know, we've encouraged her if she comes to the States, we'd love to see her. We want to stay in contact with her. Um, we, we hope to take David back, you know, a long time in the future and, and look her up. So we want to stay connected with her. The next slide then is the picture of us on Sunday morning. And we just wanted you all to know that we missed you so much on Sunday mornings. We would get ready to go to church. Um, their church service is from 8 until 11.15. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Jacob? Um, we did not understand any of it, but it was amazing how God spoke to our hearts. Like the Holy Spirit was there. You could just feel him there through their prayer. Their prayer time probably lasted 45 minutes or longer, and then their singing was another hour and a half. And I mean, it was beautiful. Even though we couldn't understand it, God just filled our spirits. All right. Um... This is, um, okay, so um, in the left picture, the, um, this is the toddler room, which is where I love to be, because um, those kids are neglected a lot because they are being potty trained, so um, they, the room smells nasty, and um, you usually get peed on, but um, I didn't care. <laughs> I just wanted to love on the kids because they didn't get it. So um, they, when you, they're very happy to see you, but when you come in with a toy, um, they're overjoyed and they all want it. Um, once you give it to them, they're not very good at sharing. So if you bring a toy, you have to bring one for everybody. Otherwise there's kicking and biting and hitting and like aggressive. So, but that's life. Um, they, um, the right picture, um, the kid on my left hip, his name is Dawins, and he definitely attached to me the most. Um, when you hold a kid, especially when they're younger, um, they never let go of you, and if you do let go of them, they will cling to you. So when you go outside of the room and you're holding a kid and then you try to put them back, they will scream and whine, and uh, that's the hardest part, leaving. But, um, it's still fun to hold them and play with them. Um, usually when I was in the toddler room, um, right when you walk in, they all run up to you and they want you to hold all of them. So I would sit down on the ground because you can't hold all of them. And so they, as soon as you sit down, they all run up to you. So I could usually fit five on my lap, <laughs> but um, yeah, but that was really fun. Um, I brought balloons one time, and they loved those. They liked chewing on them, but um, once they popped, we had to take them away, and they didn't like that very well. But um, also, they like playing with shoes because they don't have shoes, so um, they would take my flip-flops off of my feet and just wear them around, and it was just so fun to see the kids interact with me and just how they, they loved me so much. It just warmed my heart, and it was very hard to leave all of them. But um, I'm hoping I can go back soon. So, yes, the next slide. This is David's classroom. Um, this is in the back of his classroom. It's also a bedroom for usually what David's age is supposed to be, but um, he's too big for the bed, so he's in a big boy room, which is like, 11 and 12 year olds, maybe nine. So he's, there's a big age difference. But um, it's also their classroom. So during school, 
um, we would sit in the back of their classroom and just, this is when mom and dad usually emailed, this is when I went to the toddler room, um, and we just listened to him. They love to sing, they sing all the time, and um, the teacher sings just with all their hearts, it's just amazing to watch. Um, when we were there, David was learning how to write his numbers. He um, is very good till he gets to his three, which looks like an M, but if you turn the paper, it's a three. Um, but he, he's very quiet in school, and, but he's very good at it too. And um, the next slide. Um, we, this is in the back of the orphanage, and this is where we played um, sometimes. And so we're just throwing balls around. They're very good at catching and throwing, um, surprisingly. But um, they love it, and um, there are actually a couple kids that share really, really well once they get older. Um, so they would, you know, tell me to throw it to the other kid instead of just them. So that was neat to see that they share too. The next slide. Um, we loved, this is in the front porch that mom showed you earlier. They loved to jump rope. We made jump ropes out of like bands. So it was kind of like braiding jump ropes. And so we made them and they would do tricks and they would just love to jump. We could get three of them in a jump rope at once and they jumped up to like probably 50. So they're really good and they just love any toy that you bring them. Um, the boys, <laughs> they don't use the jump ropes for jump rope. They use it to um, wrap around the other kid and drag him around and <laughs> of course they're boys so we're like oh maybe we won't leave the jump ropes because they'll probably strangle each other but <laughs> so they just like that and the next slide is this is we went to the ocean and um, we drove through a town called Williamson and we didn't know if we would be able to go um, see House of Hope which is where um, Sarah and Jim and mom and dad and um, they went to I think it was six years ago five-ish um, they went and they gathered money from Valley County people and um, they were able to provide money so that workers men in Haiti could build um, rooms in this orphanage um, for the kids and so um, we mom and dad wanted us to sh sh show us this place so we got to go there um, after a couple tries evidently there's a couple orphanages in Williamson there used to not be so we would like drive up the mountain and we're like is this Valley House of Hope they're like well, he has a hope, so. <laughs> so we had to like drive back down and finally we found it and we walk in and mom and dad are like, is this the right place? Cause like six years ago, the kids are like, you know, little and now they're like my age. So um, we found it and we were looking around and um, we walk outside and it, the next slide, um, we walk outside and that lady, her name is Edna, um, she says hi and we're like oh yay someone who knows English so we talked to her and she, she we got in this conversation and she said she gave me a Bible and she points to me and um, we were like oh really and, and so I didn't remember this but six years ago um, the church family that church that we used to go to um, they um, mom organized where um, the kids in the church would give away a Christmas present that year and the money towards that Christmas present would go towards a Bible so that someone at House of Hope would receive a Bible. So mom had put my picture in this Bible and written a little note and um, she still has her Bible and she reads it she said and that's her daughter. She's married and I think she has a couple more kids so that was just really neat to you know, see God work through that even six years ago. Um, and how could I know that the Bible would even be read or used? And it still is. And it's just overwhelming to know that God is working even when we can't see Him. So, thank you. Okay.
Okay. Um, there's a couple more slides here, and then I'll get into a, a little bit of a message. This this slide was when we were at uh, the House of Hope Haiti, um, and uh, all those uh, kids, they're not kids, they're young, young adults and teenagers now, they're all supported by people in the United States. And so in this picture, um, we were actually able to meet the child that my my folks actually sponsor. And it was kind of neat because when we went in, we we, we really didn't know for sure if we'd be able to visit this place because the whole goal was to bond with with David our son and it wasn't to go see all this stuff and we didn't know if it would work out well it just so happened that when we were um, traveling to go to the ocean and uh, we started traveling and we're like you know this is really close to where we were at Tanise and where we actually played in the in the ocean uh, slide will come up a little bit later but it was like maybe three hotels down from where we actually stayed and so we tried to start asking people if they knew of this orphanage and stuff and a few of them did and so we ended up finding it but anyway as we were um, trying to find this gal we were trying to remember first of all this this young lady's name that mom and dad had sponsored and we couldn't remember it and we said do any of you know Gary and Pam Bogus as a sponsor and the, and the other ones in there are like oh yeah that's I, McLean's McLean's uh, sponsored parents and so they went and found her and so we started explaining to her that w I that I was Gary and Pam's son and her eyes just got so big and she instantly gave me a huge hug and started thanking me and and it was just really neat to see that you know these these uh, kids that that we sponsor whether it's in Haiti or whatever country it is um, we may not think that they really uh, um, connect with you, but they really do. Um, a lot of these kids, um, when you talk to them, they're, they're, one of their dreams is to meet their sponsor, um, sponsor people back in the United States or wherever they are located. So that means a lot to them. Um, this once again is the is the ocean picture, and that's um, kind of behind my head. About three hotels down was where where we stayed when we went six years ago. Greg was there. Um, and uh, actually the, the tall mountain with the clouds on it was the mountain that we hiked to go up to the mountain village. So it was really kind of neat um, the, the, to, to see that and to show our kids that. This is the area of Haiti that I tried to uh, prepare my kids for. And when we got there in Port-au-Prince, um, it's a city and People eat better in the city, and we didn't see the poverty in the city like we did in this area. And then I would tell them, oh yeah, the mountains are just brown and there's no vegetation on them. It's like a desert. This isn't the rainy season. Well, we went up to the mountains on the other side. The, the, the island is kind of like a horseshoe, so where this one is at, we went kind of on the other side. Well, the mountain was like lush and green, and they're growing all kinds of vegetables and fruits. And I look at the kids, and I'm like, um, this isn't like what I remember at all. And apparently on that side, they get rain throughout the entire year, and this side rarely gets rain in the winter months. And so just not even being more than probably 50 to 60 miles away as the crow flies, and there's just two totally different climates, two cultures, two... Uh, two different people groups. Here you saw a lot more poverty up in the mountains where it was green. We saw actually huge houses and stuff like wealth um, that I didn't realize existed in Haiti. So, um, and then the next slide. Um, that one we'll talk about and that kind of leads me into my talk so my family can go sit down so they don't have to sit up here and listen to me. <coughs> You know, a couple of weeks ago, Maceo shot me out a text and asked me if I was going to wear my, my shirt that looks like him. And I told him, yeah, we might as well because people think we're twins anyway. Um, so I don't know. <clears throat> you know, we saw God answer uh, prayers um, and we saw God move daily when we were in Haiti. And I don't know if that was um, just because we were seeking out um, how God was moving or not, but we, we saw many times a day um, how God either provided or, or just his hand on that entire trip. One of the things we've been praying for, <clears throat> for 
actually ever since we started this adoption process was that David would attach to us. Um, in an orphanage setting, um, that is something that is, is a huge concern, is attachment problems. And um, when we got there the first day, he really clung on to Carissa. She was, she was the one he went to and she, he wanted held by her and everything. So that was really encouraging for us to see. Probably hard for McKenna because almost all kids like McKenna and, and want to be with McKenna. And so when David went to Carissa first, I'm sure McKenna was, was a little worried, but it didn't take long before he, he found McKenna. Um, we went home that evening. We were able to take him back to the guest house with us. Um, we usually left the orphanage around 2 o'clock or 3. And um, when we came back the next day, we got to the orphanage, and McKenna was actually holding him. And uh, when we walked through the gates and we started up the steps to the porch where I'm standing there, um, it was really <coughs> heartbreaking because um, McKenna said that David really grabbed her tight and um, just buried his face in her arms and didn't want to be let down. He didn't really want to go back to the orphanage. He didn't want to go back there. So that was a really um, encouraging thing that he really wanted us, but yet it was really hard to see. Um, and um, in, the, in the next two to three days when he was with us, um, we, we realized that attachment, that, that prayer that we've been praying for had been answered. And within about two to three days, he was um, um, basically acting like our son. Um, when we would go and do anything that was new, um, he's a very shy child, and so anything new, he would come to us for protection, he'd hide behind us, and he'd hold on to our hands, and we could see that, that, um, that he had attached to us very, very well. Um, he, throughout the week, we, um, we didn't know what it was going to look like when we traveled there, we had shared that a little bit earlier when we, when we left, we didn't know what was going to happen. When we went, we thought we would be able to keep him with us at the house and we'd kind of spend almost every day at the house and play with him and do maybe different activities if we could. And uh, we got word <laughs> by day two that um, there was a Haitian couple that had been adopting a, a child and um, basically the, the child from the orphanage was living with them and the social worker had showed up and um, the child wasn't at the orphanage. And so they were having trouble troubles of maybe not even being able to adopt. So it was advised that we would be at the orphanage from 9 till 2 o'clock every day at least because in case they would do a surprise visit, um, we, would, we would need to be there. Um, so that's what we did. And it turned out at first our hearts sank. We're like, oh, we got to spend all that time at the orphanage. How do we bond at the orphanage first of all? Because it's really hard because you have all the kids around you and there's a lot of chaos going on. It's really hard to bond with somebody um, in that setting. But uh, it turned out to be a huge blessing. We were able to see him at school. He goes from school from about nine till noon. So we were able to see him there and even just see him interact with the other kids and uh, see some of his friends. Um, he it likes to color and it was kind of neat as time went on he would color a picture in school and pretty soon he'd turn around and show it to us and want to want us to see his picture that he colored and and things like that things just like maybe your kids would do in school so it was really neat to see that to see that happening um, and and throughout the time when he was in class we would see him every once in a while just turn around to make sure we were still sitting back there watching him and uh, that was just a really neat neat thing to um, to see um, we, we were also able to see uh, one of his close friends as a matter of fact um, the first day or two when we were there Tanisa's and our, our Oh, our, our parenting side was like, what's this, what's this bigger kid doing with him? Is he a bully? Is he picking on him? Because we didn't quite know because this kid really hung around with him a lot. And uh, we didn't know for sure what was going on. And, and as time went on, we found out that they are really, really close friends. That this, um, that this young man, this, this boy, he helps look out for, for David and uh, make sure that, that David doesn't get picked on and things like that. And we asked later on if this, if this 
this boy was being adopted, and he is actually in the process of being adopted. Um, first of all, the neat thing was from a family in the United States, and then we found out later that um, this family lives in Kansas. And so it's really neat that maybe in the future, um, when they both come to the United States, that we can travel to Kansas and they can still keep in touch with, with them. Because it was, it was clear to us as, as the days went on that these two boys are, are really, really close. Probably the closest thing to family as each one of them has. Um, one of the girls, I think it was uh, Matt Kenner, somebody shared uh, the slide when Gar meeting Gary and Mavis, the Canadian couple. Um, we, we were able to go to their house one day and uh, it was just really neat because we had things that either the church had sent with us or other people had sent with us to take to Haiti to bless those people there. And we had some medical supplies. And so we took some stuff up there because they live up in a mountain, mountain region. And uh, as they were unpacking the stuff, there was children's ibuprofen in there. And uh, Gary was just so excited to see that because that stuff in Haiti is like, 20 or 30 dollars a bottle so it's super expensive and um, Gary is known as the doctor <laughs> up there um, the 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 average age of a Haitian person is 55 that's how long they live just because um, hospitals are expensive and you just don't live past 55 in that in that area um, and so Gary it comes from a farming background he's worked with hogs and stuff and has done surgeries on them so he is the doctor um, he's after he actually has I think it's called lidocaine the deadening agent and he can do he says he hasn't had to stitch anybody up yet, but he feels comfortable where he could. So people show up all the time at their gate knocking, um, needing, needing help. Um, so it was kind of neat that we were able to bless them by giving them some medical supplies. Um, another time, oh, midway through, uh, the mosquitoes in Haiti supposedly are bad. I never got bit. <laughs> They must not like me, but Isaac was kind of a magnet for them, and Isaac and I slept on the single bed in there because it was a little bit higher and we were worried about him rolling off on the floor, so Isaac and I shared a single bed, which I had about that much, and he had the rest, and, and um, he would wake up with 10 new mosquito bites and I didn't wake up with any, and this really concerned his mother um, because of... Uh, malaria. We were taking anti-malaria pills, but yet this really concerned her to the point where um, I think Satan knew that this was a weakness of my wife's to the point where she woke up one morning and was just extremely fearful. Um, she knew she shouldn't be and she knew that God was in control, but to the point where um, it was really, really consuming her and her thoughts and she was really worried about Isaac, although he wasn't showing any signs of anything, they didn't really itch him. But when we were at the orphanage, um, God sent a couple um, that way that, that they were a missionary couple in Haiti and they were looking for orphanages to um, maybe send missions teams to and they came and there wasn't anybody at the orphanage at that time that could really speak English or knew what was going on so this couple found us because we were the only other white people there and uh, Tanise was able to talk with this lady and uh, talk to her about the orphanage and explain a few things and then um, also through the process Tanise then brought up she goes now you live here she goes what about mosquitoes and mosquito bites? And the lady said, you know, I get eaten all the time by mosquitoes. And she said, I don't know of anybody who has ever gotten malaria on these trips that have been taking these pills. She said, actually, the pills aren't good for you if you take them extended periods of time. So she goes, we don't even take the pills anymore and we're fine. So God had even sent a couple along to really calm Denise's nerves and uh, help her out in that way. Um, it was really interesting, um, just the different things that we experienced with, with David. One, simple things, uh, basic things that it took us a while to see. Um, one of them was when we would walk back to the house with David. Um, we thought he was just a really, really pokey person. 
Um, he walked so slow, we would be practically dragging him behind us to walk. And, and it dawned on me after maybe the first day or the second day when we watched him that this was probably one of the first times he's ever been outside of the walls, the four walls of that orphanage, because the walls are high enough he can't see out. So as you watched him, he was just gawking around and looking at everything because he hadn't ever seen the things that he was seeing, even though that was his own country and only five blocks away. Um, you had to be careful because as he was walking, they, they kind of like park their cars on sidewalks and it's just not at all like the United States. And so he'd be walking and he would run into cars because he was looking at things and then <laughs> run smack dab into stuff or people. He'd run into people a lot, so you had to kind of direct him where he was going. But um, little things like that, um, we, we started to, to notice. Um, in Galatians 4, it talks about um, when the time came, God sent Jesus to fulfill the law. And, and uh, in doing so, he did that so that we might receive um, the adoption as sons to him. Um, I'm going to read a passage in Ephesians. So in Ephesians 1... It said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. I believe that according to these passages, that I was chosen to be an adopted son by God. Just like David was chosen five years ago, um, when Denise and I looked through profiles of, of kids and pictures, we chose David to be our adopted son. Um, these things really resonated to me um, a lot more when I was in Haiti, and I thought of how happy I was that God that God chose me as one of his adopted sons just like we are choosing to adopt David um, in John in John 14 if you flip back a few books John 14, verse 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Um, many times, I think, in the United States especially, um, we become comfortable with the things here on earth, and we lose sight of the mansions that are waiting for us in heaven. Um, many times, me included, um, do I think that I would rather sometimes spend more time here on earth than go to heaven? And I catch myself sometimes thinking that way. And, and when, I th when I think that way, after I spent time with, with David in Haiti, it became a lot more clear to me how silly that, that feeling really is. Um, I thought of David and how the only thing he has ever known is that orphanage and that he has never tasted the foods that he will taste when he comes home. He's never had ice cream. He's never, he's never really had um, a steak or he's never had um, a lot of the good foods. What he eats every single day <laughs> is that cornmeal and refried beans that he eats. They get bread and peanut butter for a snack, um, which we also ate bread and peanut butter for a snack, which probably he was like, seriously, these people are adopting me and they give me bread and peanut butter to eat? And, uh, but um, um, they, they occasionally, on a special occasion like Christmas, will get a chicken leg. And that's about the extent of what he eats. And so um, he hasn't ever experienced what he's going to experience here in the United States. Um, David has never probably felt the love that he will hopefully feel when he comes home to our family. Um, he's never played on green grass. As you saw in the pictures, um, 
in the orphanage there isn't a single blade of grass and in probably 99% of Haiti in the houses and stuff there is no grass. He's never played on grass, he's never played on a playground like, like ours, he's never jumped on a trampoline, he's never uh, probably even petted a cat, he's probably never seen a cow. Um, all the things that, that I assume that children know, he, he doesn't know. And, and when I was thinking about that, it, it, it was really hard. Um, I'm not quite sure when that picture was taken when I was holding him, but um, it kind of captivates how we were all feeling on the last day when we had to leave David. Um, <clears throat> we, we were able to meet in an office in the orphanage that day. <clears throat> and uh, we were able to talk to him through an interpreter and um, um, we tried to explain to him that we had to leave and we had to wait for paperwork to to finish up and um, we tried to really stress to him that we promise and we we will be back we will be back and we will take you home with us to live with us forever. You will, we, we are not leaving for good, we are leaving for a short period of time, and there's so much more for you in store when, when you come. And uh, I think as we were all having a rough time with this, um, I remembered that, that this orphanage is all he has ever known for the last five years. Um, the food he's eaten, the things he's played with, the things he has done, that is all he's ever known. So. To David, um, going back to the orphanage probably wasn't as big of a deal as we, we maybe made it out to be for him because he had never tasted the other stuff that we had tasted. And um, I thought of, of me and how I view my life here on earth, how sometimes I think that things here are good and I want to stay a little bit longer and not go to heaven and, and how God must be going, but you don't realize it. What you're, what you're experiencing here on earth is nothing like what I've got in store for you. Just like we are going, our hearts are broken thinking, David, there's so much more that we're, we're going to give you and offer you when, when this time comes. And, and just like we were trying to explain to David that, that um, we will be back. We promise we're going to be back. And we have that same promise in the Bible that Jesus says that I am going to return to bring you home with me, whether it's, it's uh, when you pass away or whether it's when he comes again in his second coming. He says, I am going to come back for you and we have that promise just like Tanise and I and my family was trying to explain to David that we will be back. We're not going to forget about you. Um, and so I just want to in closing um, leave you with with a thought um, that for me not to long for heaven would be about like me thinking David is better off in an orphanage than not coming home with us. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I just thank you so much for this congregation. Um, we thank you so much for our church family. Um, I mentioned the many things that, that David will experience when he comes home to Nebraska, when he comes home to my, to my home and my family. And the one thing I think of, Lord, is the amazing church family that he is going to have. Um, the words can't express um, the gratitude um, that Denise and I have for our church family. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless these, these people for their support and uh, just their encouragement through this whole process. I thank you, Lord, for um, the trip that we were able to take. Uh, to Haiti. Um, I pray that you would protect David as you have in the past. I pray, Lord, that this time would go quickly um, while we are waiting for him. Um, I thank you so much for, for 
telling us that um, if we believe in you and we have been called your adopted sons, that you have gone and prepared a place for us, a place that is so much better than, than things here on earth, a place that we, we can't even fathom. And I pray, Lord, that we would not lose sight of that, that we would be excited to, to one day um, go to heaven and, and be with you. Uh, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I guess one, one more thing um, is um, some of you may have questions as to what, what happens next. Um, probably about 50 or 60 percent of it, we don't know <laughs> about like the rest of our adoption. Um, but from what we gather, Denise had spoken with our adoption agency about a week or so ago and asked, you know, so what, what, is, what do things look like next? Um, our, our whole trip down there, uh, one thing we had to do was meet with, um, basically it was a social worker. She asked us a bunch of questions. Um, about our family, about life, about how he would um, co-mingle with our family, what we thought of him, um, things like that. And uh, her, her report was supposed to be submitted within 10 days of that, so it should have been submitted. It should be in IBS-ER, which is kind of like the government side of things. Um, they are supposed to have that paperwork out in two weeks, or two weeks, two months. Be nice if it was two weeks. Um, they they have been given about two months. Um, if we don't hear from them that it has passed through their their government agency in two months, so by the end of February or so, we are supposed to actually contact our um, adoption agency. And even um, what's actually kind of a neat blessing is that. Um, when we were there, we were able to get David's visa paperwork started, which no adoptive family has ever been able to do that fast. Um, even when we were at the American Embassy, the gal said, now you guys are the ones adopting him? And we said, yeah. And she goes, we've never had any adoptive parents be in country when this has been going through. And um, so the, the gal at the American Embassy was extremely helpful, extremely friendly, and said, actually, if, if things don't go through in a couple months, we're supposed to call even the embassy, and actually the American government gets involved and says, hey, we need to get this going through. So that was really neat, instead of just maybe us saying, hey, we want this paperwork to, to go through, we've actually got the backing of the United States saying, <laughs> hey, you guys have to get on the ball and get this going. So that takes place. After that, it goes to some more court um, hearings um, where, according to our adoption agency, about 100 rubber stamps get stamped all over it. And so we have no idea what takes place, but we hire a lawyer to take care of that side of things. Um, when that gets really close um, and is about done in the Haitian side, it does have a little bit to, to go through with the American side, but she said once it passes through all the courts, um, we will be contacted to not buy our plane tickets yet, but get ready because this last step goes very quickly when it's on the United States side where um, we might travel in a few days from when we get that word. So our next trip will probably be a very fast, um, hey, we're leaving in about three days. <laughs> and at that point in time, we travel down, they say, plan two days, um, fly down, pick him up, and fly back is, is, is what's maybe going to happen. Um, all this, if everything goes well, could be um, as short as six months. So we're hoping maybe by, by spring, early summer, we could, we could uh, maybe be traveling to go get our son. So we thank you so much for, for all your support and your prayers. Um, just pray that, that things would continue to go well and paperwork would we get, get done. So thank you.